for joining us for the museum's Chats on the Past program, where we discuss history with scholars, authors, historians, and artisans. My name, as always, is Nicole Carpenter. I am the Programs and Collections Director for the Westport Museum for History and Culture. We, as always, are pleased to offer our free programs, but we do have a suggested donation of $5 if you can support us at this time. We understand that it is still very challenging, uh, but we do encourage you to support the museum however you can. If you would like to be notified in the future for our programs, we encourage you to follow and like us on Facebook and Twitter at Westport History and on Instagram at Westport History Museum. You can also view any of our free programs on our YouTube channel or on Facebook just by searching for the museum's name. During our program, if you have any questions, please enter them in the comments box and I will go through as many of those with our presenters as we can. Tonight, to, to introduce our speaker, I am going to hand the introductions over to our Executive Director, Ramin Ganeshram. Thanks so much, Nicole. Welcome, everybody. Um, we're so happy to see you here, and we're thrilled to be able to have this chat with Dr. Kelly Fanto Dietz, who is a research associate at the, who was a research associate at the James River Institute for Archaeology and a visiting assistant professor at Randolph College. She holds a BA from the College of William and Mary, master's and doc, doctorate degrees from UC Berkeley. Um, she is currently at Stratford Hall in Virginia, which is the seat of the Lee family, where she does amazing work um, in among other things, um, the, the, the diaspora of African people, particularly the enslaved community there. Um, this is Dr. Dietz's specialty is African diaspora cultural history, archeology, span slavery, visual and material culture, and public history. Um, she has worked as a historical consultant for television, museums, and for the 2016 film, The Birth of a Nation, about um, the rebellion led amongst the enslaved by Nat Turner in 1831. Dr. Dietz also partnered with National Geographic to produce the documentary film Rise Up, the Legacy of Nat Turner on the National Geographic Channel and author the cover story for National Geographic History Magazine entitled Nat Turner's Bones, Reclaiming an American Rebel. Her book, Bound to the Fire, How Virginia's Enslaved Cooks Helped Invent American Cuisine, was named one of the top 10 books on food of 2017 by Smithsonian Magazine, and it is a phenomenal book. Um, so welcome, Dr. Dietz. We're so happy that you're here. Um, I know that you have a presentation. I don't know if you want to say anything first, but as Nicole said, Dr. Dietz will give her presentation and then we'll have um, what I hope will be a riveting discussion on this topic. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much for the introduction, for having me here tonight. And thank you all, I would say, t for Zooming in, but this isn't Zoom, so <laughs> it doesn't quite work. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. So I'm going to go ahead and get started on my talk. So if you're wondering, I'm going to give about a 20 to 25 minute sort of snapshot of my book, and then we'll open it up for discussion, if that works. So let's see here. All right, everyone should be seeing the introductory slide here. So my book, um, of course, is entitled Bound to the Fire, How Virginia's Enslaved Cooks Helped Invent American Cuisine. Um, the purpose of this book is multifold. Uh, one, it's to give credit to the men, women, and some children that were enslaved in these kitchens, not only in Virginia, but throughout the African diaspora to give them a sense of culinary justice, a phrase and a term that a food historian uh, Michael Twitty has coined, and it's really about giving voice to the voiceless and making sure that credit is given where credit is due. Another purpose of this book is to bring attention to the kitchens that still stand throughout the United States, but especially in the South. Kitchens um, during the period, the colonial era and the antebellum period are still standing at a lot of the historic sites around the, the nation and they need help, they need attention and preservation. And then lastly, it's to tether the romance of food to the reality and pain of enslavement. So a lot of people come to my talk and they're excited about hearing about food and they wanna hear about biscuits and puddings. And I talk about that a little bit, but the purpose of this book is really to bring light and bring a, a voice and a microphone or a megaphone even to the enslaved cooks who are actually cooking the food. 
So why cooks? Um, let's talk for a minute here about what we're going to be discussing in my, my quick little synopsis today. But we're going to be talking about some of the myths that I challenge in my book. I'll be talking about the reality of kitchen life on a Virginia plantation and also the history and legacy of these men, women, and some children that were working in these kitchens. So let's just jump right in here. So myth of the plantation, myths of the plantation kitchen. I'm sure some of you, if not all of you, have been to a plantation museum and you might have gone into the kitchen and you might have heard some sort of very fancy narrative about these enslaved cooks and the mistress of the house making all of the food. So you would be lucky if you heard anything about the enslaved cook because the majority of plantation museums still in 2021 are telling the story of the mistress cooking the food um, you know, sort of working away in that kitchen. And in this picture right here is a painting. It's a mid 20th century painting from Berkeley Plantation in Charles City County, Virginia. And it's really sort of this, you know, um, this idea of this clean, happy space. So that's one of the, the myths that I've pushed back against. Now this right here, I would say, is one of the most successful propaganda campaigns in American history. So this is called Black Americana, uh, the pieces on the bottom here, these uh, sort of spice containers. You've got this um, sort of blackface mammy imagery that has become absolutely synonymous with the idea of enslaved cooks. And of course, we have Aunt Jemima, who was just recently retired this last summer, um, who has a very long history with this sort of idea. And the idea is baked into these images um, are that these enslaved cooks were happy, they were loyal, um, they were there really just to please the white families. <clears throat> and they're very also the, one of the myths as well is that they were disconnected from the rest of the enslaved community. So the people that were working in the house, people think that somehow they didn't have friendships and strong you know, connections with those who were enslaved in the field quarters and that somehow they were more culturally white um, and Uncle Tom, if you will, more so than those working in the field. One of the things that I felt find most bizarre about this propaganda campaign is everybody I've ever talked to has seen some sort of version of this, right? So there's this heavy reliance on this imagery, this iconography of blackface mammy figures, yet when it comes to actually talking about who cooked the food, they're absent from the public narrative. So let's jump right into where I work. This is Stratford Hall Plantation, 1738. It was, it was built uh, by 70 enslaved Africans from Senegambia and the Gold Coast, um, present day Ghana. They were brought uh, here, of course, against their will on a ship, and they were um, in enslaved by Thomas Lee, the original owner of this of this Georgian home. And the kitchen is right here on the right. So the, the scope of my work is large. I looked at Virginia in particular, uh, just because I had to sort of put a cap on it somewhere, but Virginia was the first colony and made sense to me. And I looked at plantations that were large enough to have a formal role, role for these enslaved cooks. So I did not look, le look at the small sort of middling farms, the smaller plantations where cooks might have been also the laundress um, or just sort of the nanny as well or the maid. I looked at these homes that were literally entertaining heads of state from around the world. And really, I think, um, these kitchens and these dining room tables were very much um, instrumental in creating what became American cuisine. So one of the myths that you run across um, when you go to a, a house tour um, anywhere, particularly in the South, is that some of the docents will say that the kitchens were moved outside because of smell or because of fire, right? So the idea of the smell uh, came from this quote from 1705. And it is all their drudgeries of cookery, washing, dairies, etc., performed in the offices detached from their dwelling houses, which by this means are kept more cool and sweet. <clears throat> Wonderful quote. It says so much, right? Um, but I want you to think for one second about what it would actually smell like in that kitchen versus in the house. During, you know, in the during the period of 1705, people were not bathing that often. So you have these, these large plantation homes being built all across Virginia. Women are coming over in droves. They're making these sort of manor homes, these small plantation estates, or even large plantation estates that were these, you know, little communities. And you had a, a white mistress of the house. 
who was there instructing the, the cook. And in the beginning, a lot of the cooks were indentured. By the time indentured servitude started to drop at the sort of mid 1600s and enslaved Africans became the more sort of prominent uh, labor force in the colony, you start seeing a shift in the landscape. So you see these kitchens being built outside of the home on these larger plantations. And you see this mostly in the Southern United States. So the sort of the, the divorcing of that, that sort of winter kitchen into the summer kitchen on these large estates has a lot to do with ideas of race and space and control. And it also, um, going back to the, the whole myth around these being attached to not the politics of race and that moment in, in American history, but attached to the idea that somehow having the hearth burning inside was going to burn the house down is a little bit silly. So I'm going to go back to my workplace here. There are 16 chimneys in that house. I'm sorry, eight chimneys and 16 fireplaces in that house. In the winter time, all of the upstairs fireplaces would have had a fire going nonstop. So again, these homes were not strangers to fires being inside of those spaces. It really does speak more to the idea of race and space and power. One of the things, too, that I, I love to sort of talk about is the racialization of objects, of landscape. Um, think about the dumbwaiter, for instance, this nice little sort of four-tiered table over here on the left that was brought over. The idea was brought over by Thomas Jefferson and really popularized in the colonies. And the idea was that you could literally replace a waiter with a, quote, dumbwaiter by having the four courses or the three courses staged on these tables. Now, why is this important and why am I bringing it up? Well, if you think about these plantations, Thomas Jefferson's plantation, you know, uh, Monticello, the Lees, uh, Mount Vernon, any of these large, really important estates where conversations about liberty were happening, where conversations about the Haitian Revolution, about Nat Turner, you know, conversations that, that are quoting, you know, Patrick Henry, give me liberty or give me death. These kinds of ideas about power and liberty were ones that enslaved folks wanted to hear about. They were creating their own kind of revolution at times. They wanted to escape enslavement. They wanted abolition to happen. But by having a, a literally a piece of furniture that would replace an enslaved waiter when certain people were coming to dinner to have those conversations, it eliminated the sort of fear of the white uh, plantation owners of having that information leak out. Um, you also see these things that are called all-weather passageways. This is Monticello. This right over here on the right is the Whistling Walk Underground Passage. That is an old sign that has since been taken down from Berkeley Plantation in Charles City County, Virginia, the same exact plantation that had that absolutely wonderful wonderfully horrible painting of the kitchen um, that I showed at the beginning of my talk. But there's this narrative as well of these underground passageways um, being built to somehow uh, cover the, you know, the weather, keep the weather from, from getting on the enslaved folks. Um, you also have a narrative here at Berkeley and at other plantations where it's this idea that enslaved people had to whistle while they walked with the food from the kitchen to the dining room to make sure they weren't eating any of the food. And that never made any sense to me. Because if you think about who cooks your food, they're absolutely eating that food, tasting that food, engaging in that food physically, right? So where on earth did this whole sort of weird myth come from? This is a Jim Crow era narrative. So yes, some enslaved folks were told to whistle as they walked through that passageway, but it had to do with alerting the white folks that people were coming, sort of similar to that dumbwaiter scenario, and less about the sort of uh, intimacy of eating the food. And so this Jim Crow era sign really speaks to this era that happened after um, emancipation where the, the history of slavery was very much uh, sort of uh, rendered to reflect a Jim Crow separate but unequal sort of narrative versus one where there was inequality absolutely during enslavement, but you know, black and white folks in the South were literally living in the same space. You had African-American women who were enslaved who were literal wet nurses to their, their enslaver. So again, this is a very important sort of political myth that is, is important to be debunked. Let's talk here for a moment about some Southern hospitality. Now, you guys are up north. I don't know if there's any Southerners in that in the, uh, the room now watching this. But when I give this talk down south, people get all excited about this. But I want to take a minute to really sort of talk about the importance of Southern hospitality and why that is important to talking about enslaved chefs. So Southern hospitality 
was literally built into the fabric of the early colonies. These um, pineapples right here on the right, you will find all over the South. They are on, these are, these are you know, bookends. You find them on everything from carriages to, you know, to ironwork to and all the architectural details. And the pineapple is symbol of hospitality because it was the most rare, exotic, expensive fruit you could have had during the colonial era. So the Lees, for instance, were getting shipments um, from all over the world. They were getting rum from the Caribbean. They were getting Madeira, uh, you know, insisted on it coming coming down and being toasted on the equator to then be dropped off at Stratford Hall. And on those same shipments, you would find like, on occasion, a pineapple might make its way and survive the ship, the shipment up to Virginia. If you get that piece of fruit that is exotic and it really shows that you're connected to this whole Atlantic world, and then you share that with your guest, you are the most kind, open, hospitable person in the colony. So that's how that happened. And why does this matter? Well, food was at the center of hospitality and who was cooking the food. So these early, I mean, I didn't say too early, but these, uh, you know, 18th century and early 19th century Virginians, these elites were eating seriously like kings and queens. The enslaved chefs would have to cook sometimes up to, you know, three courses for a, a dinner. It would be um, a first course of all different kinds of puddings and, and dried fruits and those kinds of things. And you have another course right here. This is a good second course on the right. You've got a big old, I think it's like a leg of lamb. You've got little pies. You've got a cabbage. You've got all these, you know, tarts. I mean, they ate so much. Um, and they the enslaved cooks had to cook so much. So think about not only how food was a, a you know a way to flex your your sophistication and your and your wealth but these enslaved cooks had to cook so much food that was never actually eaten right so the whole idea was to sit for hours to eat a little bit of everything and then to have the next course come on so these enslaved cooks were not just overworked in terms of the amount of food they had to get on the table at the same time all cooked perfectly because they were enslaved and there was always a fear of abuse um, but they also had to cook for a lot of people. They had barbecues for up to 100 people, you know, fish fries. I mean, they were constantly, constantly serving those who enslaved them. So I want to take a second to just think about where the labor of enslaved cooks and also just, you know, field laborers ended up. How does this, is this important when we're thinking about the currency of drinking and food in the colony? Um, this portrait right here is really symbolic of a bunch of men in a parlor and they've got wigs on and it is like clearly 18th century. They are sipping wine and Madeira and ports. They're probably sitting there smoking tobacco that was grown um, by enslaved laborers, enslaved African-Americans or African-Caribbeans. You've got them drinking rum that was made in the Caribbean. Um, rum actually is a West African recipe that was invented uh, in Barbados in the early 1600s because they were producing sugar in Barbados. They had a way to, of course, turn it into the molasses and into the cane, the, the ground cane for the crystals, but they were throwing away the sort of the used um, sugar cane and the enslaved community knew exactly what to do with that because they'd been making palm wine in West Africa for centuries. And so they turned that into what is now known as rum. So I want to talk for a moment about the labor, the reality of these, these folks that had to work in these kitchens. So a lot of people think that somehow if you worked in the house, you had it easy. These folks, um, these African-American men and women working, this is Stratford Hall's kitchen right here, um, they had to work literally sometimes around the clock. They had to cook so many different courses. Some things on the dinner table might have taken two days to a week. Some might take 10 minutes. They would constantly be having to stir things on the on the hearth. They had to sleep in the kitchen. They were also always on call. You could arrive at a place like Stratford Hall at, at 12 at night or, or two in the morning if you're coming by carriage and a bell system would ring and you would have to wake up and make sure that whoever, that free person or free people that came through that home, um, of course, was given the most hospitable Southern welcome you can imagine. So these enslaved chefs also had to lift huge pots of water. They, they actually died more from burns than any other group of people during this era. Um, one of the things that I've heard from several African Americans from their ancestors being passed down is that their ancestors had were told they had to put their arm in the bake oven and when it almost burned, it was ready for bread. 
Imagine having to bake bread every single day for the person who's enslaving for you, having to stick your arm in that oven, getting those burns day after day after day. Talk for a second here about um, some of the, the food that was served in Virginia that became very much Americana. Um, Okra stew is something that was eaten all throughout Virginia and other places as well in the African diaspora. But okra is a West African, you know, vegetable that came over on those ships and was cooked by enslaved African-Americans, Afro-Caribbeans. Anywhere you see African descended people in the diaspora, there's some sort of version of okra that they're eating. You also have um, a dish here. The Up on the top left, you've got an oyster stew. People along the coast in Virginia ate oysters, an oyster stew constantly. So oysters were eaten almost every day. An oyster stew, now think about this. The enslaved cooks say you're making dinner just for the least. So there's eight of them at dinner time. They want a three course meal. One of the seven things in that three course meal and one of the courses is going to be an oyster stew. If anyone has, has ever had to shuck an oyster, much less a recipe that calls for 100 oysters, making that roux on that open fire, making sure there's no grit, and that as well, because remember these folks were enslaved and it's, it's you know, they were always sort of living under the fear of being abused by the mistress of the house or the overseer. So having to put that kind of labor into one dish was very time consuming. Something that I found in the records, which was incredibly fun. So I was a professional chef for 10 years in California. So when I, when I stepped into the archive and I started to read these old cookbooks, what I did is I did two things. One is I opened it up, I opened these cookbooks up and these are the cookbooks that are not published. These are the ones that are literally in the archives in the Virginia repositories at the Library of Virginia, you know, UVA, um, College of William and Mary Special Collections. And I would open up these cookbooks and it was fascinating because you could see immediately which recipes were the most popular recipes. Just like if you got your grandma's church cookbook, those dirty pages are the ones that were probably used more than once. So I looked at that and sort of figured out which dishes were more popular, which were used a lot, which had a lot of sort of doodles on them and, and little notes. And then also I found out through looking at a series of cookbooks starting in the, the earlier ones in the 18th century all the way up to the 19th century is I started to see the, the incorporation of West African dishes, jambalaya, gumbo, um, peanut soup, all of these things are the children of West African dishes that made their way in the minds of the enslaved cooks across the Atlantic onto these plantations. And by the 19th century, they became written down in these white lady cookbooks as part of what they were serving, part of American cuisine. The kitchen as well was a place where people would come together. So this right here is the uh, the kitchen ball at White Silver Springs in 1838. And some of the evidence that I found was the kitchen being used as a sort of social space, a gathering space for the folks from the field to come up. There were re wedding receptions at some of the kitchens in Virginia for the enslaved folks. So the kitchen was sort of a space where the, the people on the field would come up at night because the cook had to work 24 seven, keep that person company, you know, sort of get the news, maybe hear about Nat Turner's rebellion if they got news of that, um, those kinds of things. So this image, when I found it, I was so excited because it speaks so much to what I saw in the records as these kitchens being spaces of not just culinary collisions, but also black folks, white folks, free, uh, you know, enslaved, coming together in the space to eat and sort of, you know, uh, do things like have a wedding for an enslaved person. One of the things that I mentioned in the beginning of my talk was this sort of idea and this myth that these enslaved cooks somehow were disconnected from their West African roots and that they had sort of the closer they got into that white domestic space, the less black they became, the less African they became. And something that really pushed back against that was the archaeological evidence. So there's um, significant evidence in Virginia and Maryland from the 18th century that shows these cooks in these kitchens um, in this particular space, they were they were conjuring their ancestors. They were um, they had evidence of caches, so cache as in a, a bag of um, crystals and pieces of iron, different things to conjure certain deities, just to conjure your ancestors. Um, these sorts of things were absolutely happening in that kitchen space. So if you imagine that that cook having the power, is you know he or she was cooking all the food for the big house, but they were also helping some of the enslaved folks in the field quarters and other areas um, with their like their root work and their religious work. 
one of the things that I found most fascinating in all of this was the um, the power of poison. So you can imagine um, as an enslaved person, if you have the power to kill the person who's oppressing you, who's enslaving you, it'd be very easy to do so. So a lot of these folks that were coming over from West and Central Africa, um, they had deep knowledge of, of um, root work, of you know, of medicine. And so they were growing similar things, things like nightshade, right? It was grown on these plantations. You could kill your enslaver very quickly by putting some of that in their milk, for instance. There's evidences of that um, as I worked through the archive. And one of the things I found really interesting was that when um, <clears throat> certain sort of, okay, first of all, I found really interesting that the back of those same cookbooks that I talked about earlier that had all the different like, notes in them and the dirty pages, the backs of all of those are all medicine. So it's the tonics to, to give, you know, the children if they're sick. It's all these different remedies that the enslaved cook was also responsible for not only making, keeping in their possession, but also sometimes administering. The difference between medicine and poison is simply dosage. One Motrin versus a whole bottle is a totally different beast. So they had the, the power to do this. Um, and I think that more cases than not, they use that threat of power more than the actual power because of what would come. And you can look in my book and I list a list of um, the people who were accused of poisoning their enslaver and then were executed. So the, the risk of doing so, the punishment was doing so was so absolutely strict and just horrific that I think it kept a lot of them from actually doing it, but it's the threat of that that gave them the power. So when Nat Turner's rebellion happened, when the Haitian revolution happened, you see these waves of fear sort of rushing throughout these slave states and these ladies that are these mistresses of these homes are terrified to eat dinner. They're literally giving the enslaved cooks a few days off to not have to worry about what they're eating. So I wanna end here uh, by just talking about this woman on the left, um, she is the cover of my book. And one of the things that I said that I really wanted to do with this book is to give power to the voiceless. Um, so many, I'm not going to say so many, with the exception of only a few, all of the enslaved cooks throughout the African diaspora are not in the records. You can find them in the records of the food that they were cooking, the archaeology, the, the, the records they left behind, the oral histories that were passed down. Um, but we were lucky enough, and I was lucky enough when I was doing my research, to find this absolutely stunning portrait um, done in 1855 by a man named David Hunter Strother. He was writing for Harper's Weekly Bazaar, and he was writing around the South sort of capturing, you know, what life was like in 1855. And he found himself on a plantation in Amherst, Amherst County, Virginia. And he stayed there for the night. And he was so struck by the cook at this plantation that he wrote a whole missive about how powerful she was, how intelligent, how she had control of the entire house, how her children had the first dip in gravies and ate the breasts of fried chicken. So he not only waxed poetic, for lack of a better phrase, about this woman, but he also took time to draw her. So we don't know what her name was, but her image speaks to the literal tens of thousands of enslaved cooks throughout the colonies who have not had credit until now. And of course, I've got this wonderful Betty Saar piece here, The Liberation of Aunt Jemima, which is so much more prevalent and relative now as she has been become retired. Um, but my work, I hope that it, it gives them voice, that it shows that they were powerful um, and subversive actors in their oppression. I'll stop sharing. So that was amazing, Kelly. Thank you so much. For Thank that. you. Get um, all excited. So. <laughs> believe me, I know. You know that I know. So, <laughs> um, so tw you know, we are going to, for our audience, um, we are going to talk about kind of implications of Dr. D's work um, at, you know, for, for uh, New, New England, for the North, for other colonies um, and later states. Um, she talked about oysters, for example, which are, we know here in this area, oysters were and still are incredibly popular, were eaten daily as well, um, and are, are very difficult <laughs> to open and very difficult to work with. But before we talk a bit about that, I, I would like to know, and I didn't know that you were a chef, which is yeah. interesting, you know? I didn't know that. Um, and as someone who also was a chef, I feel like I kind of 
sort of know the answer to this question, but I'm going to answer, ask you it anyway, is um, how did you become interested in this topic, particularly of enslaved cooks in American history? I mean, cooks are interested in other cooks on some level, right? Yeah, but, yeah definitely. Right? <laughs> they really are. But, you know, how did this topic start to speak to you? Like, well, you know, where did you first start to think about it? Yeah, so I was 17 years old. I grew up in Berkeley in Oakland, California, and I was 17 years old, and my dad brought me out to Virginia. He was working out here. He was also a historian. He brought me, funny enough, to Berkeley Plantation, that same place that I, I like to poke a little bit when I'm giving my talks. And I went there, and I'd never been in the South before. I'd never been on a plantation, and it was something that really you know, it was, it was striking. It was weird. You know, it was very just different than growing up in California where the African-American history there is very centered around the civil rights movement and the Black Panthers. And so this earlier African-American history, I hadn't really been exposed to. So I came out, I was also 17. So I was kind of like, really, I have to go on this museum tour with my dad. And, you know, at that point, I'd been working in restaurants since I was 10 years old. And so my whole family's in the restaurant industry. And I was sort of like, okay, where can I find a connection here? Because the whole tour was about the white people. And so I really didn't even have that sort of excitement about, oh, here's some history about African descended people. It was really just like, okay, here's Mr. Harrison and blah, blah, blah. So I go outside and I look over and I see the kitchen. And I literally, I just remember being pulled in like a magnet, looking in the windows. And all of a sudden I was like, I have so many questions about this space. Like that is what struck sort of, that was the, 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 the match that struck my passion for history was that particular moment. Now, fast forward, I'm getting my PhD at UC Berkeley. I'm trying to figure out, you know, what my dissertation is going to be. I'm like, okay, this has to be something that I'm passionate about that I want to spend every moment thinking about and then giving talks on for 10 years afterwards. And so I just found myself like a, a good history nerd. I was looking through the Virginia Get Gazette online newspaper that you can see at Colonial Williamsburg. And I was reading the paper because what else do you do if you want to work in the 18th century? And I found a bunch of for sale ads for enslaved folks who were cooks. I mm. immediately was like, that's it. Uh, so many questions came to me, you know, what were their kitchens like? What was the food like? You know, what was their labor like? Did they have power? What were the gender dy dynamics? So for me, it was just sort of, it was that initial seed then struck again with reading an 18th century newspaper. So we, one day, not here, I will tell you my story about going to Mount Vernon with my father. Oh, yeah. And, <laughs> yes. And the experience there and kind of how that that stuck with me. Um, so can you talk to us about the experience interpreting the lives of an enslaved people um, at historic sites, which is it's an evolving field of study for historic sites around America. Um, we at Westport Museum, as our listeners, some of our viewers will know, did an exhibit, an award-winning exhibit um, about the history of African-Americans in Westport a couple of years ago. Um, and there are difficulties in terms of uh, the, the practicality of finding the research material and in, pres you know, in presentation um, and the interpretation. And I'd, kind of, I'd like to know what were some of the unexpected things you encountered and were they you know, different because you're focusing on cooks and people, you know, in the kitchen space. Yeah, absolutely. So I've helped a lot of museums um, throughout the mid-Atlantic area deal with that sort of the question of how do we interpret enslaved life here? So whether it's, you know, really just more of the field quarter scenario or the house, I think what this kitchen, these kitchen spaces do is they allow um, a more neutral space to sort of start talking about enslavement. Just like the beginning of my talk, I said, you know, some of you are probably here to, you know, to learn about biscuits or whatever it might be. When you pull in something like food or a kitchen space, that is something that every human being has a connection to, you can then start to have those harder conversations. So I always tell my clients, and I, I'm doing this work at Stratford, you know, when you have a kitchen, and you have a history of enslaved labor, it is, you know, you have no excuse for not talking about the history of enslavement because you can do it in a way that is respectful. You can do it in a way that is really bringing those stories to light, but also reaching people who would never step foot in the slave quarter exhibit down the road, but they're going to be in that main white occupied house, they're going to end up in that kitchen. So, you know, that space is the, the most amazing stage to have those kinds of conversations. That's a really good point, actually. I never, I, I don't think I quite thought about it that way. Like, I, but yeah, that's a great point. 
So, you know, the, the work that you're doing, I think, you know, one of the things that we find is that it's really easy in the North, particularly in New England, particularly in Connecticut, which has this false sense of itself as an abolitionist <laughs> state, which we know it was not. Um, it was probably the most southern of the New England states, literally and figuratively, um, in term, especially w with respect to this topic. So it's easy, you know, for for people, for viewers, for visitors to our location, to visitors to your location, to think, oh, oh, but this this didn't didn't happen in the north, or this doesn't have to do uh, with the history of the north. Yet, you know, we know that that's not true. The field of study isn't as um, anywhere near what it's been in the South, thanks to people like you with respect to enslaved cooks. But I'm interested in your thoughts on that, how this experience in the South translates, gives us potentially pathways um, to begin this work elsewhere. Uh, you know, in New England, for example, New York, Absolutely. So, you know, that's a great question. So I think about the work that I do. If you think about a plantation in the South, I mean, you're talking about, you know, thousands of acres, these gigantic land spaces, right? Um, in the middle of all that is this little nucleus of the plantation sort of complex. It's the big house and the outbuildings and everybody working within that. In so many ways, places like in New York and Philadelphia and places like New Haven, right? you might not have these, I mean, there, there were big plantations, but not as many, right? It's a very sort of urban, very different environment, but that dynamic of that closed space is very similar than you would find if you cut off all the acreage on a plantation and transplanted, you know, Stratford Hall and the surrounding acre around it into a place like Philadelphia, into, you know, Connecticut, you're going to have a very similar sort of dynamic within that space because people are literally working right next to one another. Um, you've got, you know, the sort of this, the very closeness of, and I don't mean like in a good way, but the very like close, like physical space between people, um, I think really speaks to a different kind of enslaved experience. Because, you know, even thinking about too, I mean, you mentioned New England, my goodness, you know, all the work that Harvard has done and, and Yale of with all the, you know, the, the institutions that really relied on and Brown University, not just enslaved labor, but you know, the slave trade. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of ways that you can be connected to that history that doesn't necessarily attach itself to a 2000 acre plantation with 150 enslaved people. And, and I think what we also have to remember is, you know, a lot of the sites that, that lend itself to a similar experience may now be city bound, but once we're not, I think, you know, the Absolutely. Royal House and Gardens, in Boston is a good example, right? Royal House and the and the quarters there is a great example of that. You know, mm -hmm. it wasn't hemmed in by the city in the period that um, we're talking about. You know, one thing I've thought about a lot with this, with respect to the kitchen um, in my own work and keeping up with your work is, um, I wonder if you could talk about, in fact, what I, and what I see as the lack of privacy for the enslaved cook right? Because you are, as you said, working around the clock, you're constantly working with other people, there is the constant interaction with the mistress of the house. Whereas if you worked in another part of the plantation, or you worked in another part of even the homestead, let's say here in, in New England, mm -hmm. uh, in the field, in the blacksmith shop, you probably had some smaller measure of personal privacy um, than it, when you were in the kitchen, constantly Absolutely. interacting with the people you were feeding. Right. Absolutely. Or imagine having to be, you know, a nursemaid, someone who's literally sleeping at the foot of your enslaver's bed, you know, so absolutely. I mean, privacy, that's something that that was rare. You know, they were constantly under watch. And even the ways in which these landscapes were set up, you see the windows from, you know, a lot of times the mistress's house literally looks right or window looks right into you know, the, the kitchen window. And so, you know, you don't know if she's looking at you or not because of the way it's set up. And so, you know, the ways in which the landscape, the cultural landscape was designed was very much not like a prison complex, but definitely had that kind of, you know, that gaze, intentional gaze set into it. Yeah. Perpetual monitoring, you know, and the, and, and the fear of it. Um, what's the most surprising thing you've learned? In, in this research that you've done. And there's always the potential to be further surprised. We know this, right? Um, but so far, what is the most surprising thing that you learned? I think one of the most, I think it was the kitchens as a social space. Um, the amount of 
interracial interaction that happened in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. I mean, the first time I read it in someone's diary, I was like, that's interesting. And then I just kept finding it and finding it and finding it. And again, so much of 2020th and 21st century ideas and knowledge about the period of enslavement was written during the Jim Crow era where, you know, blacks and whites were not allowed to be next to each other. I mean, it literally, that propaganda campaign is really steeped into the fabric of our nation. So seeing all of these, you know, I mean, I can't even count the times that I've read that in letter or a reference or like, you know, so little Phil is in the kitchen again. And it's like, they were actually like in that space together. And, you know, it's, it's such a different idea than what we think about in the 21st century. And, and, you know, and it's especially, I would say here in the North where you are talking about smaller, um, you know, homes and smaller environments, you know, and uh, the tavern environment, uh, I, you know, you saw a lot more of that, right? Um, that idealized idea of the mistress of the house cooking along with um, the enslaved people, you know, not quite that, but you did see you know, more interaction, particularly in, in commercial enterprises. You know, if you were a taverner and you had an enslaved cook or you had an enslaved um, help, you know, you, you there probably was more of that cooking alongside or working alongside on some level could not have been easy you know talk about the constant monitoring oh, can you uh, I mean, imagine i mean even the no, smaller plantations, not- plantations in the south and the farmsteads or the urban areas i mean i just you know to yeah to have to have that literal like proximity next to that person constantly would drive me ca- completely insane yeah no it would be i mean and that just speaks to the strength mm-hmm. of each and every one of these people and the mental fortitude of each and every one of these people to be able to persevere and to go on in that situation all the while with the threat of bodily harm at every minute right so absolutely um, so you know i want to talk about um at stratford hall uh you know the cooks who worked in that kitchen they were really chefs right they weren't just cooks they prepared food at the highest level of cuisine of the time yeah um and you know, there's 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 some more discussion of this. Like you have Caesar, you know, the chocolatier, the enslaved chocolatier, um, that I know is often interpreted by the wonderful um, Dontavious Williams. And um, <laughs> yay, we love him. And um, you've had you know the work of Michael Twitty and so on. And we're and we're really talking about. Um, it's interesting to me that this is sort of like the first four way four ways. So there's Caesar at Stratford Hall, obviously. James Hemings, the enslaved cook of, of Thomas Jefferson, um, Hannah Till, who was George Washington's camp cook, who by all accounts cooked at an extremely high level just because he was out war in the field. He still right. ate, you know, very well. And of course, Hercules Posey, who you know is my one and only. So- I know, I feel the same way. We might have to fight over him, I know. I, know. I love his story so much, so kudos to you for doing that work. Thank you. Um, and but but I want to talk to you about average families, right? So we talk about as chefs, as people working in this space, we talk about these, you know, the the big guns, right? Hercules and James and Hannah and Caesar. Mm-hmm. I'm interested to know what the work about the work you've done uh, around cooks and chefs who kind of don't have that big dramatic story. Um, mm-hmm as a selling point to the public, right? Um, have you found anybody that you think is particularly interesting? Like you mentioned the lady who's the cover of your book, amazing mm-hmm. story. Um, how much of that, you know, did you find in the, in the record? I mean, or the, are those the individuals that we just do not know it? We cannot Yeah, they're it. harder to find because if you think about, you know, the ones that were cooking for the George Washingtons, et cetera, there's papers galore. I mean, you know, Jefferson in particular, my God, he wrote all the time. So there's just so much, you know, correspondence to come from the average Mr. Johnson down the road might not have been, I mean, maybe not even literate. You know what I mean? Like, you don't know. Right. I mean, like literacy rates were so right. low. So you know, their records aren't as good, but there is there are ways through archaeology, through oral history, um, to sort of help figure that out through food ways. Mm-hmm. One of the women that I actually start my book with is a woman named Suki, who was um, she died right before the Civil War, and she was 50 something years old, and she died from a hemorrhage womb. And I start the entire book out with her because 
Her name was Suki. That's all we know. We don't know anything else. If she had children, if she was a grandparent, we know that she literally probably worked herself to death. And so, yeah. you know, it's, it's moments like that where, you know, I will find a record of somebody dying who was an enslaved cook from a certain thing. In this case, Suki died of a hemorrhage wound. And having lifted big pots myself, thinking about somebody at, you know, at the age of 50 in the 1850s, that's a lot. You know, I can see how that could have actually, you know, ended, ended her life. And so I was able to infer this sort of story about her from what I knew from other sites and just sort of using common sense, using our, our culinary knowledge from like how much work it takes to actually put a menu on to really sort of bring that texture of everyday life to those people. So I do, I did find a few people. She is who I start my book out with. And so she to me sticks out as someone who, you know, it wasn't that governor chef, but absolutely cooked, you know, herself to death. Yeah, and I think that's that's an, that's a really important point. And I, and we and you know, as a professional cook, even today, there are injuries in the kitchen, right? You know, I have injuries still from working. Same. I'm sure you do too, right? I'm back and to his toast. You know? Yeah, gone. Yeah, and that's many school compared to what these these individuals yep. um, bore on a daily basis. And absolutely, um, you know, I think that that, that that's an important to understand. So before we take questions from the audience, I just want to ask you one more thing. And I would like to know from you what you think is what you when you do your talks and when you do your interpretation, when you do you speak to people just going about your daily life. What is the thing that you really want people to know the most about the experience of enslaved cooks? Like if, they, if you, there's, there's so much to say, but if there was only one thing that you could say, what is that thing that you want people to come away with? I want to, them to remember them and acknowledge them. So that's two things, but I think it's one and the same. I want them to acknowledge that they were there, that they helped invent American cuisine um, and remember them through, you know, honoring their, their legacy, you know, thinking of them when they eat gumbo, thinking about them when they go to a plantation site and going into the kitchen, ask questions, you know, who was enslaved here, sort of being active participants in the world of history, I think is really important because again, you know, food can bring people into this conversation in ways that other things can't. And to ignite that same sort of, you know, thing that happened to me when I was 17, to be able to ignite that in people as they read my book to hear about these cooks and this food, they're learning more and more about the enslaved experience. And so for me, it's it's those two things. Yeah, that's that's amazing. And I, I, you're 100 percent right. I always um, one of the things I always point to that I think everybody in America can relate to is do you eat rice? Do yeah. you eat American rice? Right. So we know, right. you know, that knowledge came from enslaved Africans, mm -hmm. you know, from the, you know, rice growing areas uh, in West Africa and came and they with that knowledge to the Carolinas and, and built that rice industry. Right. Absolutely. All of us have had rice, whether we like it or not, you know, mm -hmm. whether we love it or not, you've had it. Right. So that's who you can thank for that, that, you know, what is now kind of an American staple. Absolutely. So having said that, um, and that, that was amazing. So thank you for speaking with me. And I just want to, um, you know, see if there's any, I think I did see a couple of questions. Uh, Nicole, I don't know if you can field those. Uh, so we did have one question that we actually already addressed um, about uh, wanting to know what the most surprising thing that you uncovered your research. And I do think you touched on that. Um, we have had so many comments. Um, thank you all, our audience. Um, also saying how informative and fascinating this is. We have also had um, quite a few comments saying that they love this idea of acknowledgement, um, of even if we don't know their names, of acknowledging these cooks and these enslaved peoples who were working in these kitchens. Um, I did have a question actually, uh, <laughs> a little selfishly working in the museum field. Um, I'm wondering how you are seeing, um, or if you are seeing a shift in the way that museums are interpreting this information. And I'm hoping that that's a growing shift that you're seeing, but I'm just wondering if you are seeing that shift um, in the field. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I am very excited about the work that Michael Twitty, you know, has been doing for so long and people like Dontavius and Nicole Moore, uh, Cheney McKnight. There are so many, Brenda Parker, there's so many people that have, have been doing that hearth cooking 
for so long, you know, trying to acknowledge and remember those people. But I feel like the mainstream narrative is sort of now just catching up with what we've all been doing for a very long time. So I do see, you know, a rise in interest of historic sites to have people like myself and others come speak. I feel like there's a, with a lot of the political stuff that's happening now too, there's this sort of frantic, like, push to like, okay, we have to check some boxes, which drives me a little crazy, but at least they're doing it. So, you know, I mean, after George Floyd happened this summer, after all of that, even when the Black Lives Matter, you know, uh, stuff first happened, there was a sort of pendulum swing and everyone's like, okay, we have to take care of these issues. You know, this is a, a new buzz thing. Then there's those of us that have been doing it the whole time. And so I think that there's both waves of improvement lots of step, step backs, but it's it's waves on a beach of sand of these sites that are sort of slowly being pulled into the, the current. So that was a weird way of saying, yes, I think it is making a difference. Um, I do know that when I was writing my book and it was funny because I had an original press and I won't say who they are, but um, they didn't like that it was short. And I said, look, I want it to be read because I'm a PhD and I don't have time even myself to read a 300, 500, 600 page book. I wanted a book that could be used and read by docents, people without college degrees, people without high school degrees. I wanted it to be accessible because this information is so important. I wanted it to be sold in museum gift shops. And the, the editor said, well, we don't want that. And I was like, then goodbye. So I found yeah. somebody else. Kentucky has been amazing. And this book, I, every time I go somewhere at a plantation museum, I go in there, like even secretly. And I'm like, there's my book. So, you know, the work that we do is starting to make a difference. And, it, you know, I think we're all better for it. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, I, Nicole knows I tell the staff probably every week if not every other day every day is black history day in america mm -hmm. there is no america without black history right so um i say that to say there are these waves and these pushes and everyone you know recently is like yeah we gotta we gotta get on this but you know yet it's been going it's been going on i think what i'd like to know um from you is not to say that it's easier but there's a benefit of having a site, like you said, to have a kitchen, to have that space uh -huh. that is somewhat neutral or accessible to a certain type of visitor gives you an entry point. Um, it's more difficult to talk about these things when you don't have um, uh, archaeological uh, evidence or material uh -huh. culture that, that relates to it. So I'll, I'll give an example. The site of our museum, in fact, was uh, the home of the son of a very prominent landowner who ended in slaver here in, in Westport. And uh, his, his name was Ebenezer Coley. And he built a house on the site of where the museum is today for his son, Michael, to manage uh, a general store that he had down the street that is also still there. The building is still there. Um, and by all accounts, we know that it was the enslaved people uh, that, that belonged to the father who managed the store because Michael was something of a reprobate, right? So we know that they moved between, uh, and our house, which is an Italian age structure, is we now know from various things we've done in the last couple of years, built around the second period colonial structure. So uh, just kind of what we know in, in reconstructing history and the way we know that slavery worked in the North, uh, these people clearly went between the farm and the outskirts of the town, it's not an outskirt anymore, to the store, to the home. So, but we do not have the remains of that house where they cooked, where they lived. Um, and we struggle with this a lot, right? So we have the site, we could tell the story, we don't have, um, you know, that material culture, that, you know, remaining to help us. And I wonder if you have a thought about that. Yeah, do you have the names of the enslaved people 
we we don't know who specifically was in the house. We're guessing based on what they did, but yes, some of them. We think. Okay, we well, I think and, you know a lot of us have that have to do this work. You know, there's a lot of guessing, a lot of inference, and that's all yeah. we have. You know, one of the things that I've run across so much um, when I do consulting work at museum sites, they'll say, "Well, we don't have really any records." You know, we only have a couple of names, and I'm like, "Okay, but what can you infer around those names? How old are they? They normally know some stuff." So I think if you do what they call, you know, peopling the places just develop, even if it's somewhat fictional, develop a bit of, you know, biography around those different people. I mean, Suki, who starts my book out, literally, I had a, a death notice that she died, how old she was, and that she was a cook. And I was able to write an entire page, single space, about what her life must have been like. So I right. feel like there's ways to almost like triangulate all the other things that you do know into those people. And honestly, you know, I, I guarantee, I don't guarantee, I can't guarantee, but I'm sure that they would appreciate any attempt to tell their story. If you get their age wrong, if you get the fact that they did something that they didn't do wrong, I think that that's okay if you do it with respect, but I feel like even having names for people, it will resonate with them afterwards. You know, thinking about if you have a story that you can attach to somebody that you can sort of infer from what you know about the site, they're gonna think right. about that as they look at bricks at another site somewhere else. I wonder if, you know, um, Al, you know, Alfred was doing that here too. You know, like it just, it helps. So just build those people profiles up. And if that's all you have, that's all you have. But it's saying their names. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great point. We do have a brick walk of enslaved people. Okay. People that we know were enslaved in Westport on our property that were part of the exhibit. The exhibit came down, we installed a brick walk. Um, but yeah, I, I like, I, I'm kind of happy that we have your permission to like create this, you know, biographies of Amos was one of the gentlemen um, and um, Aunt Lid, right, Nicole, who was, you know, there, so there are, and um, Sibby and, and there are people that we know, right? So we can, we can, uh, so now that we have your imprimatur. <laughs> yeah, no, and I've done that at Stratford Hall with tremendous success. And I've got this wonderful graphic artist. She's our curator. She's doing these gorgeous silhouettes. If you go to Stratford Hall's uh, Instagram page or Facebook page, you'll see some of the work that she's doing. And she's she's drawing these gorgeous you know, silhouettes of these African descended people. We don't know what they looked like, but right. you know, again, just giving them a face, taking their name, giving them a voice is is so important. Yeah, and we're lucky. We have a very talented young illustrator on our staff. Who's See, you are lucky. So that, <laughs> yeah, we are lucky, yeah. So We uh, do have one other question here, Kelly, from our audience. I will pop it up on the screen here. Uh, Sarah is curious, what other books you would recommend uh, for people to learn more? I will say to our audience um, on the museum's uh, virtual website, Virtual History Westport, um, we do have our remembered exhibit there if you would like to learn more about Westport's um, black history, including the uh, period of enslavement. Um, we do have some resources there, but I would love to know what you would recommend as well, Kelly. So, of course, you know, Ramin's book, I think, should be read as well. Um, but I think, you know, it depends on what topic. If you want to go the food route, of course, there's Jessica Harris. There's Psyche William Forenson, who I love dearly. Um, there's Michael Twitty. You know, those books are, are good places to start. Um, Adrian Miller, who's a colleague of ours and friend of ours, he writes a lot about, you know, president's kitchens and food and that kind of thing. Um, if you really want to sort of dive in and get a nice introductory um, text on in enslavement. I would really recommend anything by Ira Berlin. He's one of my favorite yes. historians. I-R-A Berlin, like the Berlin Wall. He is accessible to read. Um, he's got, was it, Many South Thousands Gone and Generations of Captivity. And yeah. it just, it goes chronologically and, and geographically in the United States. And it is written in a way, I mean, it's, it's what I read as an undergrad that got me really sort of into the field. And it's something that I assign to my students as well. So that's a great place to start. Of course, there's phenomenal African American scholars as well that that write on this. So you know, don't forget to to look up their work as well. But there's just there's so much great work. But to start out with a sort of you know cliff notes of sorts, um, just a dive deep. I would I would recommend Ira Berlin. Yeah, who sadly only passed away just a year or two ago, right? Yeah, and, and, you know, phenomenal, phenomenal scholar. Those are amazing. Amazing books. And I would add that here in Connecticut, if you want to know about the period of enslavement and Connecticut's role actually in supporting slavery in the South, 
um, the book Complicity by yeah. Joel Lang and others who, uh, it started out a series for the Hartford Current and won the Pulitzer Prize. And so for this state that I think is a key text, very accessible uh, because it was written for a newspaper, very readable for, a, a, you know, just as a, as a book for the general public. So as we wrap up this evening, um, I do want to make another shameless plug for the museum. We are hosting Adrian Miller in a couple of weeks. I believe he will be with us in April. So do tune in again for his talk. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us this evening. We do encourage everyone to pick up a copy of Bound to the Fire. Uh, we recommend going to bookshop.org to support our independent booksellers if you can. So thank you so much, Kelly, and thank you so much, Ramin, for joining us this evening. Thank you for time. having me. Thank you. It was a real it's pleasure. We really story. appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thanks for thank you. <laughs> Um, and thank you, of course, to our audience for tuning in this evening. We hope you will join us for our future programs. Enjoy the weekend, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>